tonight, markets take another hit as fears grow over the financial fallout from the coronavirus. Also tonight, families of people killed in the Burke Street rampage slam the police on the final day of the inquest. The Holocaust to become compulsory learning in Victorian schools to combat the rise of anti-Semitism. There is the rise of the far right in aspect in countries around the world, including in some parts of Australia. And a daring escape on the streets of Sydney. Good evening, Paul Higgins with ABC News. After a stellar start to the year, the Australian share market has lost $129 billion in three days. Stocks fell another 2.3% today, extending the week's losses to around 6%. It followed a drop of more than 2,000 points on Wall Street after health authorities warned of a potential outbreak in the US. All types of companies are now suffering, and not just on the stock exchange, with many raising concerns that the impact will be long-term. Andrew Robertson reports. While another day of bloodletting on the stock market grabbed the headlines, pain from coronavirus is being felt in the real world. Such as outdoor game designer Peter Nickel. He's worried it could be many months before his suppliers in China can fill his orders. It'd be disastrous because if we don't have product, we, we've got nothing to sell. Peter Nickel is concerned that even when China's factories do get back on their feet, they'll be focusing on their bigger customers in the United States. What might normally take two to three months um, could take as five or six months. Retailers exposed to China are also having a torrid time. Fantastic furniture shares shedding another 11% today. The reject shop down 10%, electronic seller Kogan and Mosaic, the owners of Rivers and Noni B, off seven. At Australia's biggest retailer, Woolworths, concerns are growing about Big W's ability to get what it needs from China. We'd have to say the world has changed in four days, so, uh, and it might change yet again, let's all agree, in the next week. Like Qantas, Virgin Australia is being hit hard by the coronavirus-caused downturn in travel. It's axing seven planes from its fleet, five of them from budget carrier Tiger Air, and says the coronavirus cost will be up to $75 million. It is a resilient industry. It bounces back pretty quickly. And I think the ability to weather the storm is the most important part of any airline at the moment. What caused markets to tank today was a warning from the United States Centre for Disease Control and Prevention that coronavirus may spread in the States. The Australian market has seen around $120 billion wiped away in just three sessions, and many people are now looking hard at the likely impact on this superannuation. The second half of the year should probably be uh, pretty decent for superannuation returns because the outlook for the global economy is still pretty positive. But that may change if coronavirus's global march can't be stopped. Andrew Robertson, ABC News. The Australian government has a plan in the event of an uncontained coronavirus outbreak here. But so far, there have only been 15 cases in Australia and they've all recovered. Large public gatherings would be cancelled, people encouraged to work from home and the infected quarantined by force if necessary under the plan. The government's forecast budget surplus could also be wiped out. Here's political editor Andrew Probin. That pot of gold remains elusive. You promised last year, in fact, you talked about the budgets back in black already. You produced ads with back in black. The Liberal Party even released back in black coffee cups. Are you embarrassed by that hubris? Well, we're back in balance and no one can ever take that away from us. The Treasurer laying the groundwork for humble retreat. Back on track and back in the black. On the election campaign boast that came with its own soundtrack. A return to surplus unravelling due to the drought, bushfires and now the coronavirus. Our concern now is the number of countries outside of China are making it more likely that we will have further outbreaks in Australia. The chief medical officer making it clear that a World Health Organisation declaration of a pandemic would not necessarily trigger drastic measures. If a pandemic is declared but we're in containment in Australia, 
we'd, we will just continue what we're doing now. That's just, it's just a label. But a plan's in place if containment's impossible. Large gatherings would be cancelled, people told to work from home, elective surgery suspended, intensive care beds increased, mortuary services prioritised aged care homes locked down and childcare centres closed. Children are in influenza, the super spreaders. Those infected would be quarantined by force if necessary. Both the states and the Commonwealth have, uh, have power. But we're not there yet. There is no reason to uh, change anything you do, wear masks or behave in a way that is different from normal. But we are preparing. When the government of a sporting nation like Australia is working out whether it should be sending athletes to the Tokyo Olympics in July, you know it's serious. In this country, Olympic medals are held dearer than political baubles like budget surpluses. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. The key concern for the Australian government and countries across the world is whether the limited number of outbreaks become more widespread. The death toll in Iran has risen to 16, the highest outside China. Neighbouring countries, including Afghanistan and Iraq, have just reported their first cases, all in people who had been to Iran. In South Korea, the number of cases has jumped to almost 1,000. That's still the largest outbreak outside China. And in Italy, 11 people have now died after contracting the virus. There's also concern that it's the source of a wider outbreak in other European countries. Europe correspondent Linton Besser reports from one of the worst affected regions in Italy. Empty planes and empty terminals. Where are you from? Oh, Australia. We flew from London. As Italy races to contain the outbreak. Across the north of the country, 50,000 people are in lockdown. I'm trying to get home, to turn back home, because my babies, my children are sick. A red zone is being enforced around 11 northern towns. Only those doing critical work or delivering vital supplies are allowed in. Very few are allowed out. In practice, at the moment, no one is authorised to leave. On the edge of Codogno, a box of supplies left on the road for a daughter being kept beyond arm's reach. There's beer, water, Coca-Cola, milk, sugar, coffee, cigarettes. For the next few weeks, this is as close as they're going to get. Obviously, we see each other on video calls, but this is all we can do. Local hairdresser Gaetano Kalea has been ordered not to leave his front door after one of his clients tested positive for the virus. The food's running out. This is what's left. If we have to be here for 14 days, we'll need help. He's worried about his heart condition. This is what I have left, and when they're finished, I won't have any medicine. Potential carriers are being transported for testing by the Red Cross which is taking every precaution not to add to the problem. The Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conti called a meeting of regional governors to coordinate the country's fight against the disease. We have to have measures that are more effective and presented in a rational way. Otherwise it will create confusion for the citizens. But the rest of Europe is watching on with alarm. The efforts of Italian authorities to prevent the spread of this virus may have been too little too late, with new cases reported in Austria, Croatia and even the Canary Islands all linked back to this area. Linton Besser, ABC News, outside Codogna. Well, to other news now, and back home, Victoria police officers, more focused on their own safety, should hand in their badge. That's the message from the widow of one of the Burke Street victims on the last day of the coronial inquest. It's almost three years now since six people were killed and dozens injured when Ga James Gargasoulis went on a rampage. Court reporter Danny Tran reports. As James Gargasoulis spiralled out of control, police could only watch on helplessly as he went on a rampage killing six people. If this is the best that Victoria Police can offer, then we are better off protecting ourselves. The families of the Burke Street victims addressed the coroner on the last day of the inquest, their rage blistering. Matthew C died on the operating table after being mowed down. 
His wife Melinda spoke of her anguish and fury at risk averse Victoria police officers. You should not carry the badge or wear the title if you're not willing to risk yourselves for the community. And she feared history would repeat itself. The unfortunate reality is that I will probably witness another vehicle attack in my lifetime. The family of Yosuke Kano, who travelled from Japan, spoke of how Australia was no longer the nation they thought it was. I feel my younger brother was killed by this country, Australia, his brother Junpei said. I see Australia as a country where you were murdered just because you happened to be walking on the street. In the hours before he went on his bloody rampage, police officers engaged in a desperate cat and mouse game. If someone needs to take this vehicle out before it kills someone received. Trying to cajole the killer with calls and texts. But an internal review that police failed to suppress now acknowledges that was the wrong plan. You cannot negotiate with a psychopath via text messages. There's no doubt these hearings have had a profound impact, not only on the families of the bereaved, but on the psyche of a city. The coroner has adjourned these hearings as she considers the mountain of evidence before her, and oral submissions are set to be heard in May. Danny Tran, ABC News, Melbourne. Israel's president says he will intervene in the case of accused child abuser Malka Leifer if her extradition continues to drag on. President Reuven Rivlin made the commitment during meetings in Canberra today, saying he would raise the issue with the country's chief justice. It comes ahead, ahead of what will be the 64th hearing to decide whether Malka Leifer will be extradited to Melbourne on 74 charges of child sex abuse. Have they not dragged on long enough? We hope that the president will actually stay true to his word and bring it up with the chief of justice, but why wait? The former head of the ultra-orthodox Adar school is arguing she is mentally unfit to face trial. A request by Lifer's alleged victims to meet with the president during his visit was refused. The Holocaust, its history and impact will be compulsory education for all Year 9 and 10 Victorian school students. World War II is already part of the state's curriculum, but learning about the genocide of the Jews is not mandatory. The Victorian government says with racism on the rise, that must change. It comes after a warning this week from ASIO's Director General that neo-Nazis are becoming one of Australia's most challenging security threats. Things like this have many concerned about growing anti-Semitism. It is frightening. It's still on their eyes. It's still on their eyes. A Victorian parliamentary inquiry has been launched into whether the Nazi symbol should be banned after this flag was hoisted in Western Victoria. But it's far from the only recent incident. During the federal election, images of the federal treasurer were defaced in Melbourne. There is the rise of the far right in, aspect, in countries around the world, including in some parts of Australia. And the Victorian Education Minister has decided, after he found many high school students didn't know about the genocide, to act. Uh, year 9 and 10 students uh, will be taught about the Holocaust. World War II is part of the curriculum, but under the changes, the Holocaust will be mandatory. The program is designed in conjunction with the Jewish community. And these are lessons that are relevant to uh, people today like racism, anti-Semitism, how to stand up to it. Australia has about 100,000 Jews. Many came here as refugees after surviving the Holocaust. The story of the Jewish people and what happened to them during World War II isn't something you can only learn about in a school book. In Melbourne, it's living history. At this museum, there are more than 20 Holocaust survivors who work here educating anyone firsthand about what happened to them and their people. Six million Jews were killed in Europe because they were simply Jews. We are all human beings, regardless of the colour of the skin or hair or eyes or religion. A lesson everyone needs to learn. Iskander Razak, ABC News, Melbourne. Still to come this hour, the growing number of Australians who can't get enough work to make ends meet. I struggle to pay my bills, I struggle to pay my mortgage. We have to fight for any overtime if it's available. Part-time jobs are growing at a faster rate 
than full-time jobs. A lot of those people would prefer to have more work. Also, the unlikely property hotspot that's outperformed Sydney and Melbourne. That's coming up. Well, despite public and internal pressure, the Andrews government has announced the duck season will go ahead this year. For more, I'm joined by our state political reporter, Richard Willingham, who is near Bairnsdale tonight. Rich, last year the season was shortened. How long will it be this year? Well, good evening, Paul. Yes, it's going to be even shorter this year. It's gone from nine weeks last year to just five weeks this year, beginning in May, the first weekend of May, and going through to June 8. Now, this year, shooters will only be allowed three ducks per day to be shot. Now, there had been a lot of pressure for this season to be cancelled altogether because it's been very dry conditions and also because of the impact of the bushfire. Now, the Game Management Authority has acknowledged the dry conditions, but says the bushfires have had a minimal impact on bird numbers and habitat. And what sort of response has there been to this announcement? Well, the response has been both anger and disappointment from both sides of the debate. Pro shooters are saying the government has bowed to green ideology and the fact is that this doesn't stand up. They say this is unfair, that's a token season. They also say it's a further blow for regional communities already reeling from the bushfires because they say shooters come in and boost the local economy. On the other side, people who have been trying to protect ducks and ban this sport for some time say this is a missed opportunity and the environmental conditions are putting further pressure on ducks and that's why the shooting season shouldn't be going ahead. Now, it's also interesting, there's been quite a little bit of disappointment from people within Cabinet who want this, this, this sport to be outlawed. They're disappointed and blaming the Premier for allowing it to go ahead. But I think given the Premier banned or is phasing out logging next by the end of 2030 and made this announcement last year, it was always going to be very hard to do a further hit on regional communities. Paul. Richard Willingham in Bansdale. Rich, thank you. Victorians will pay more to get rid of their rubbish after the state government announced it will nearly double the landfill levy. The levy will increase from $66 per tonne to $126 per tonne over the next three years. The Andrews government says the increase is designed to stop Victoria becoming a dumping ground for hazardous waste from other states. Business groups say the rise will be passed on to residents through higher council rates. Consumers are likely to see this across the board. They'll see it particularly when they go to, the, to their uh, landfill site because there will be an increase there. They'll see it in their rate pay when they pay their rates because the councils are not going to wear this cost. The announcement comes after Premier Daniel Andrews couldn't rule out another city rate rise to pay for a new four-bin system for households. Ratepayers in Geelong have been left fuming after the council voted to rip up a multi-million dollar bike path that's only just been finished. Cyclists say it's a step backwards and the state government is so angry it's threatened to freeze funding for any future projects. But Geelong's mayor is standing by the decision. The award-winning infrastructure project is less than two years old. Now the city of Greater Geelong says part of the so-called green spine along Mallop Street has to go. To provide more access for pedestrians and more access for disability as well. The project opened in 2018 after an $8 million investment, largely funded by the state government. But now the council wants to spend $2 million of ratepayers' money, ripping up a bike lane on one side and reintroducing turning lanes for cars. Ratepayers get frustrated when money seems to be being spent um, to undo something, but I think if you look at it in terms of modifying to make it better, it might mean that there's less money spent on the next section. The mayor says traders wanted the change because the new design stops shoppers coming onto the street. One cafe owner says he just doesn't want any more construction work. I love the green spine, but no changing. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very hard for us again. And we went through collectively about 11 months of that and don't want to go through that nightmare anymore. Cyclists say Geelong is pedalling backwards. More and more cities that are really serious about sustainability and don't, aren't just talking about it as a so a feel-good thing, they're um, yeah, getting rid of cars from the CBDs. Look, I think cyclists always complain, don't they? I'm, I'm one of them. Um, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but we are working towards a solution that keeps cycling as the preferred option. The Mayor says the work is simply a modification which will allow cyclists to connect to other bike paths planned around the city. But the State Government is furious. 
it's an outrageous decision. Uh, we are looking at all our options at the moment about how we freeze money. The state government may even try to take control of Mallop Street. Other options might be can we take over this road and make it a state road so they can't rip it up. It's unclear when council plans to start the demolition. Stephen Schubert, ABC News, Geelong. It's like a storyline from Hollywood, being frozen when you die with the hope that one day you'll be brought back to life. Well, that's what some Australians are preparing to do as the construction of the Southern Hemisphere's first cryonics storage facility gets underway. And as Erin Somerville reports, the small New South Wales town of Holbrook is the unlikely site of this futuristic endeavour. It's a question Hollywood has been asking for decades. It's perfectly normal to feel confused. And now a group of forward-thinking Australians are getting in on the act. The way science and that are today, just ask yourself, why should you die? They've signed on to be frozen after they die, in the hope one day they'll be brought back to life. The more time you can spend with your family and friends, uh, if it's possible, why wouldn't you take that chance? Ron Fielding had planned to move to the United States to prepare for his frozen post-life. But now he may be able to stay closer to home, with work underway on Australia's first cryonic storage facility in Holbrook, about halfway between Sydney and Melbourne. This is exciting for me to keep Dad here and uh, with us here in Australia, and obviously for me, um, yeah, that, that if, if one day um, we can be together again, then yeah, so that that would be fantastic. 27 people have paid $50,000 each to be stored here using techniques developed in the US. When they die, they'll be slowly cooled and the water in their cells will be replaced with a kind of human antifreeze before they're frozen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. The technology to put a body into a state of suspension is already here. Now it's just a wait for those who choose to be frozen on scientists to work out how to bring them back to life. With things like the Human Genome Project and, and stem cell therapy and all sorts of other amazing technological advances, people are starting to think that anything might be possible. If all goes to plan, the facility could be ready to freeze its first customer by the end of the year. Erin Somerville, ABC News, Holbrook. In finance, it's not just the coronavirus weighing on the local share market. Earnings season is also providing some surprise results. Here's Alan Kohler. It was another 3 percenter in New York last night, making a rare double. There have only been four of those in 10 years. And it brought the Dow Jones average back to where it was before the Federal Reserve started printing money again last October, quantitative easing, when the overnight money market rate spiked to 10% and the Fed turned on the liquidity hose to keep things nice, which worked very nicely. Last night's fall took the one-year return of the Dow Jones to below that of Shanghai Composite, the main Chinese share index, which is interesting. But this is the era of globalised supply chains, in which no country is an island, especially China. And further on that theme is the Baltic Dry Bulk Shipping Index, which is regarded as a reliable indicator of the world economy. It's collapsed, back to near record lows. The local market didn't fall 3%, but not too far off that in the end, and it's now down 6.5% in four days. And there were a few 3 percenters among the leaders today, among them Qantas, CSL and Woolworths, which keeps turning up wage underpayments. There were a few nasty prangs from unexpectedly poor results as well, including, fittingly, the panel beating business AMA Group down 25%. Funeral business Invocare jumped 14%, but not because investors think the coronavirus will produce more customers, but because of better than expected 2019 earnings. There were some unexpectedly poor economic data out today as well. December quarter construction down 3%, especially residential and especially in New South Wales. The oil price dropped 3.5% last night, and last but not least, the Australian dollar slipped below 66 for the first time since 2009. And that's finance. In sport, Australian cricketer Elise Perry will play in tomorrow's World Cup T20 match against Bangladesh despite a shoulder injury. Perry, who hasn't missed a match so far this tournament, flew to Canberra with her shoulder strapped. Captain Meg Lanning said the star all-rounder has been managing the injury after hurting it in the women's big bash last year. She's 
trained every time we've been out there training and she's played every game. So it's nothing that's going to keep her out of any games or anything like that. She'll train fully today. So um, I'm sure there's a few players out in this competition who are managing injuries. And um, yeah, she, she's a professional. She, she deals with it really well. Australia is currently third in Group A with one win from two matches. An investigation is underway into how three baboons managed to break out during a visit to a research facility at a Sydney hospital. One of them was there to have a vasectomy. Their escape sparked a police chase and it raised questions about risks to the public after it was revealed the animals had been used for medical experiments. A daring hospital breakout. Oh my God. <laughs> No, where are they where stopped. are they coming from? That sparked a flurry of excitement in Sydney's inner west. <laughs> the three escapees were quickly rounded up and carted back to captivity. I have to say, my heart was with the baboons. They're fine. They're fine this morning and having a banana breakfast. A 15-year-old male whose breeding days are over avoided an uncomfortable procedure. One of them definitely did not want a vasectomy. <laughs> His two female companions were there to keep him calm, but it didn't go to plan. An investigation is now underway. There was a technical failure in some of the caging equipment that was completely unexpected. We have no idea what those animals have been used for. Um, if they bit somebody, if they bit another animal, we have no idea what the repercussions of that could have been. The Animal Justice Party says it's a reminder that millions of animals are still being used in experimentation in Australia. The trio are part of a colony of baboons bred here in Wallachia in Sydney's west for medical research. The primates at this facility undergo a wide range of scientific experiments in a bid to find out more about human conditions including pregnancy issues, diabetes and brain function. Our estimation of the numbers held in the Sydney breeding facility is about 165 baboons. The fleeting bid for freedom did buy one baboon some time. His operation postponed until after he's recovered from his adventure. Amy Greenbank, ABC News, Sydney. Well, cooler weather has arrived in Victoria, to the relief of many, I'm sure, and there are no signs of any heat waves for at least another week. Last night, as low as six degrees of Mount Baubal in the east and Mount William in the west. It stayed above 21 degrees, though, in Albury, Wodonga. Showers moved across southern Victoria through the day with a cold front. You can see it there moving in. Only a millimetre or two of rain for most places. 11 millimetres, the biggest fall at Mount Baubal. But there were wind gusts of 100 139 kilometres per hour at Wilson's Prom. Mostly sunny in the north where Albury, Wodonga and Mildura top scored with 27. When that cold front hit Melbourne, it dropped uh, around 15... Oh, sorry, it dropped from 18 to 15 degrees around 10am before recovering to 19.2 at 2.11 this afternoon. Right now outside, 17 degrees. There was six millimetres of rain at Fernie Creek, but just 0.2 of a millimetre in the city. It's been a hot day in Sydney ahead of a southerly buster change. Cairns had 43 millimetres of rain in just one hour last night and Perth 19 millimetres with severe thunderstorms that rolled through. Ex-cyclone Esther continues to head west across the Northern Territory while dumping a lot of rain there. And cyclone Ferdinand is sitting off the nation's northwest, but that should stay well offshore before weakening. Meanwhile, the former cyclone Esther could become a cyclone again off the west coast over the weekend. For us, the tail end of a passing front will bring a late shower or two to southern Victoria. More rain though tomorrow across the tropical north. Perth and Brisbane will also have showers and thunderstorms in Adelaide Park partly cloudy. Hobart's in for afternoon showers, in Canberra becoming sunny, and Sydney will have a cloudy day. Back home, cool overnight, plenty of single-digit lows, and then warm and sunny north of the divide and also over our east. But cloud will tend to build up during the day over our south, with light showers along the coast west of the prom. They'll extend inland at night. On the bays, a westerly wind at 10 to 20 knots, getting up to 25 knots in the afternoon and reaching 30 knots tomorrow night. Strong winds tomorrow on the bays and west coast, gales on other coastal waters. Well, it could turn out to be Melbourne's coldest night so far this month. 10 degrees in the city, sunny in the morning, then a cloudy afternoon, a light shower in the evening. Mostly in our southeastern suburbs, a moderate westerly wind. 
Mostly cloudy on Friday with a morning shower or 220. Saturday partly cloudy with light winds tending southerly in the afternoon, 22. To kick off March on Sunday, a partly cloudy 23. Monday, a possible shower 23. Tuesday will bump it up to 25 with partly cloudy skies. And 26 on Wednesday with a slight chance of a shower. And that's all from the news team here in Melbourne tonight. And now here's Lee Sales with 7.30.